Chapter sixty five of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Marden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Luke Sartor. Chapter sixty five Why Some Succeed and Others Fail. Life's highway is strewn with failures, just as the seabed is strewn with wrecks. A large percentage of those who embark in commercial undertakings fail, according to the records of commercial agencies. Why do men fail? Why do adventures into business, happily launched, terminate in disastrous wreck? Why do the few succeed and the many fail? Some failures are relative and not absolute. A partial success is achieved a success that goes limping along through life. But the goal of ambition is unreached, the heart's desire unattained. There are so many elements that enter into business that it is impossible to more than indicate them. Health, natural aptitude, temperament, disposition, a right start and in the right place, hereditary traits, good judgment, common sense, level-headedness, etc., are all factors which enter into one's chance of success in life. The best we can do in one chapter is to hang out the red flag over the dangerous places, to chart the rocks and shoals, whereon multitudes of vessels, which left the port of youth with flying colors, favoring breezes, and every promise of a successful voyage, have been wrecked and lost. The lack of self-confidence and lack of faith in one's ideas, in one's mission in life, have caused innumerable failures. People who don't get on, and who don't know why, do not realize the power of trifles to mar a career. What little things are killing their business or injuring their profession, do not realize how little things injure their credit such as the lack of promptness in paying bills, or meeting a note at the bank. Many men fail because they thought that they had the field, and were in no danger from competition, so that the heads of the firm took it easy, or because some enterprising, up-to-date, progressive young man came to town, and before they realized it, took their trade away from them, because they got into a rut and didn't keep up-to-date stock in an attractive store. They don't realize what splendid salesmen, an attractive place of business, up-to-date methods, and courteous treatment of customers mean. Men often fail because they do not realize that creeping paralysis caused by dry rot is gradually strangling their business. Many businessmen fail because they dare not look their business conditions in the face when things go wrong, and do not adopt heroic methods, but continue to use palliatives until the conditions are beyond cure, even with a surgeon's knife. Lots of men fail because they don't know how to get rid of deadwood in their establishment, or retain non-productive employees, who, with slipshod methods and indifference, drive away more business than the proprietors can bring in by advertising. Many other men fail because they tried bluff in plays of capital and proper training, or because they didn't keep up with the times. Lots of young people fail to get ahead and plod along in mediocrity because they never found their place. They are round pegs in square holes. Others are not capable of coping with antagonism. Favoritism of proprietors and managers has killed many a business. A multitude of men fail to get on because they take themselves too seriously. They deliver their goods in a hearse, employ surly, unaccommodating clerks. Bad business manners have killed many a business. Slave-driving methods, inability to get along with others, lack of system, defective organizing ability have cut short many a career. A great many men are ruined by sidelines, 
things outside their regular vocation. Success depends upon efficiency, and efficiency is impossible without intense, persistent concentration. Many traveling men think that they can pick up a little extra money and increase their income by taking up some sideline. But it is always the small man, never the big one, who has a sideline. Many of these men remain small, and are never able to rise to a big salaried position because they split up their endeavor, dissipate their energy. Sidelines are dangerous because they divert the mind, scatter effort, and nothing great can be accomplished without intense concentration. Many people are always driving success away from them by their antagonistic manner and their pessimistic thought. They work for one thing, but expect something else. They don't realize that their mental attitude must correspond with their ambition, that if they are working hard to get on, they must expect prosperity, and not kill their prospects by their adverse mental attitude, their doubts and fears. Lots of men are ruined by a sure thing, an insider tip, buying stocks on other people's judgment. Many people fail because they lose their grit after they fail. Or when they get down, they don't know how to get up. Many are victims of their moods, slaves of despondency. Courage and an optimistic outlook upon life are imperative to the winner. Fear is fatal to success. Many a young man fails because he cannot multiply himself in others, cannot delegate his work, is lost in detail. Other men fail in an attempt to build up a big business. Their minds are not trained to grasp large subjects, to generalize, to make combinations. They are not self-reliant, depending upon other people's judgment and advice. Many a man who works hard himself does not know how to handle men, and does not know how to use other people's brains. Thousands of youths fail to get on because they never fall in love with their work. Work that is drudgery never succeeds. Fifty years ago, a stable boy cleaned the horses of a prosperous hotel proprietor, who drove into Denver for supplies. That boy became governor of Colorado, and later the hotel keeper, with shattered fortunes, was glad to accept a place as watchman at the hand of the former stable boy. Life is made up of such contrasts. Every successful man, in whatever degree and in whatever line, has at every step of his life been on seemingly equal terms with hundreds of his fellows who, later, reached no such measure of success as he. Every miserable failure has had at some time as many chances and at least as much possibility of cultivating the same qualities as the successful people have had at some time in their lives. Since humble birth and handicaps of every sort and degree have not prevented success in the determined man, since want has often spurred to needed action and obstacles, but train to higher leaping, why should men fail? What causes the failures and half-successes that make up the generality of mankind? The answer is manifold, but its lesson is plain. As one writer has expressed it, every mainspring of success is a mainspring of failure when wound around the wrong way. Every opportunity for advancement, for climbing for success, is just as much an opportunity for failure. Every success quality can be turned to one's disadvantage through excessive development or wrong use. No matter how broad and strong the dike may be, if a little hole lets the water through, ruin and disaster are sure. Possession of almost all the success qualities may be absolutely nullified by one or two faults or vices. Sometimes, one or two masterful traits of character 
will carry a person to success, in spite of defects that are a serious clog. The numerous failures who wish always to blame their misfortunes upon others, or upon external circumstances, find small comfort in statistics compiled by those who have investigated the subject. In analyzing the causes of business failure in a recent year, Bradstreet's found that seven-tenths were due to faults of those failing, and only three-tenths to causes entirely beyond their control. Faults causing failure, with percent of failures caused by each, are given as follows. Incompetence, 19%. Inexperience, 7.8%. Lack of capital, 30.3%. Unwise granting of credit, 3.6%. Speculation, 2.3%. It may be explained that lack of capital really means attempting to do too much with inadequate capital. This is a purely commercial analysis of purely commercial success. Character delinquencies must be read between the lines. Forty successful men were induced not long ago to answer in detail the question, What, in your observation, are the chief causes of the failure in life of business or professional men? The causes attributed by these representative men were as follows. Bad habits, bad judgment, bad luck, bad associates, carelessness of details, constant assuming of unjustifiable risks, desire to become rich too fast, drinking, dishonest dealings, desire of retrenchment, dislike to say no at the proper time, disregard of the golden rule, drifting with the tide, expensive habits of life, extravagance, envy, failure to appreciate one's surroundings, failure to grasp one's opportunities, frequent changes from one business to another, fooling away of time in pursuit of a so-called good time, gambling, inattention, incompetent assistance, incompetency, indolence, jealousy, lack of attention to business, of application, of adaptation, of ambition, of business methods, of capital, of conservatism, of close attention to business, of confidence in self, of careful accounting, of careful observation, of definite purpose, of discipline in early life, of discernment of character, of enterprise, of energy, of economy, of faithfulness, of faith in one's calling, of industry, of integrity, of judgment, of knowledge of business requirements, of manly character, of natural ability, of perseverance, of pure principles, of pure courtesy toward people, of purpose, of pluck, of promptness in meeting business engagements, of system, late hours, living beyond one's income, leaving too much to one's employees, neglect of details, no inborn love for one's calling, overconfidence in the stability of existing conditions, procrastination, speculative mania, self-indulgence in small vices, studying ease rather than vigilance, social demoralization, thoughtless marriages, trusting one's work to others, undesirable location, unwillingness to pay the price of success, unwillingness to bear early privations, waste, yielding too easily to discouragement. Surely here is material enough for a hundred sermons if one cared to preach them without attempting to discuss all these causes of failure, some few may be profitably examined. No youth can hope to succeed who is timid, who lacks faith in himself, who has not the courage of his convictions. 
and who always seeks for certainty before he ventures. Self-distrust is the cause of most of our failures, said one. In the assurance of strength there is strength, and they are the weakest, however strong, who have no faith in themselves or their powers. The ruin which overtakes so many merchants, said another, is due not so much to their lack of business talent as to their lack of business nerve. How many lovable persons we see in trade, endowed with brilliant capacities, but cursed with yielding dispositions, who are resolute in no business habits and fixed in no business principles, who are prone to follow the instincts of a weak good nature, against the ominous hints of a clear intelligence, now obliging this friend by endorsing an unsafe note, and then pleasing that neighbour by sharing his risk in a hopeless speculation, and who, after all the capital they have earned by their industry and sagacity, has been sunk in benevolent attempts to assist blundering or plundering incapacity, are doomed, in their bankruptcy, to be the mark of bitter taunts from growling creditors and insolent pity from a gossiping public. Scattering one's forces has killed many a man's success. Withdrawal of the best of yourself from the work to be done is sure to bring final disaster. Every particle of a man's energy, intellect, courage, and enthusiasm is needed to win success in one line. Draw off part of the supply of any one or all of these, and there is danger that what is left will not suffice. A little inattention to one's business at a critical point is quite sufficient to cause shipwreck. The pilot who pays attention to a pretty passenger is not likely to bring his ship to port. Attractive side issues, great schemes, and flattering promises of large rewards too often lure the business or professional man from a safe path in which he may plod on to sure success. Many a man fails to become a great man by splitting into several small ones, choosing to be a tolerable jack at all trades rather than to be an unrivalled specialist. Lack of thoroughness is another great cause of failure. The world is overcrowded with men, young and old, who remain stationary, filling minor positions, and drawing meagre salaries, simply because they have never thought it worth while to achieve mastery in the pursuits they have chosen to follow. Lack of education has caused many failures. If a man has success qualities in him, he will not long lack such education as is absolutely necessary to his success. He will walk fifty miles if necessary to borrow a book, like Lincoln. He will hang by one arm to a street lamp, and hold his book with the other, like a certain Glasgow boy. He will study between anvil blows, like Elihu Burit. He will do some of the thousand things that other noble strugglers have done, to fight against circumstances that would deprive them of what they hunger for. The five conditions of failure, said H. H. Vreeland, President of the Metropolitan Street Railway Company of New York, may be roughly classified thus. First, laziness, and particularly mental laziness. Second, lack of faith in the efficiency of work. Third, reliance on the saving grace of luck. Fourth, lack of courage, initiative, and persistence. Fifth, the belief that the young man's job affects his standing, instead of the young man's affecting the standing of his job. Look where you will, ask of whom you will, and you will find that not circumstances, but personal qualities, defects and deficiencies, cause failures. This is strongly expressed by a wealthy manufacturer who said, Nothing else influences a man's career in life so much as his disposition. He may have capacity, knowledge, 
social position, or money to back him at the start, but it is his disposition that will decide his place in the world at the end. Show me a man who is, according to popular prejudice, a victim of bad luck, and I will show you one who has some unfortunate, crooked twist of temperament that invites disaster. He is ill-tempered, or conceited, or trifling, or lacks enthusiasm. There are some men whose failure to succeed in life is a problem to others, as well as to themselves. They are industrious, prudent, and economical. Yet after a long life of striving, old age finds them still poor. They complain of ill luck. They say fate is against them. But the real truth is that their projects miscarry, because they mistake mere activity for energy. Confounding two things essentially different, they suppose that if they are always busy, they must of necessity be advancing their fortunes, forgetting that labor misdirected is but a waste of activity. The worst of all foes to success is sheer, downright laziness. There is no polite synonym for laziness. Too many young men are afraid to work. They are lazy. They aim to find genteel occupations, so that they can dress well, and not soil their clothes, and handle things with the tips of their fingers. They do not like to get their shoulders under the wheel, and they prefer to give orders to others, or figure as masters, and let someone else do the drudgery. There is no place in this century for the lazy man. He will be pushed to the wall. Labor ever will be the inevitable price for everything that is valuable. A metropolitan daily newspaper not long ago invited confessions by letter from those who felt that their lives had been failures. The newspaper agreed not to disclose the name or identity of any person making such a confession, and requested frank statements. Two questions were asked. Has your life been a failure? Has your business been a failure? Some of the replies were pitiable in the extreme. Some attributed their failures to a cruel fate, which seemed to pursue them and thwart all their efforts, some to hereditary weaknesses, deformities and taints, some to a husband or a wife, others to inhospitable surroundings and cruel circumstances. It is worthy of note that not one of these failures mentioned laziness as a cause. Here are some of the reasons they did give. J.P.T. considered that his life was a failure from too much genius. He said he thought he could do anything, and therefore he couldn't wait to graduate from college, but left and began the practice of law, was principal of an academy, overworked himself, and had too many irons in the fire. He failed, he said, from dissipating his energies and having too much confidence in them. Rutherford said he had four chances to succeed in life, but lost them all. The first cause of his failure was lack of perseverance. He tired of the sameness and routine of his occupation. His second shortcoming was too great liberality, too much confidence in others. Third, economy was not in his dictionary. Fourth, I had too much hope, even in the greatest extremities. Fifth, I believed too much in friends and friendships. I couldn't read human nature, and did not make allowance enough for mistakes. Sixth, I never struck my vocation. Seventh, I had no one to care for, to spur me on, to do something in the world. I am seventy years old, never drank, never had bad habits, always attended church, but I am as poor as when I started for myself. GCS failed dismally. My weakness was building air castles. I had a burning desire to make a name in the world, and came to New York from the country, rebuffed, 
discouraged, I drifted. I had no heart for work. I lacked ability and push, without which no life can be a success. Lacked ability and push. Push is ability. Laziness is lack of push. Nothing can take the place of push. Push means industry and endurance and everlasting stick to itiveness. A somewhat varied experience of men has led me the longer I live, said a great man, to set less value on mere cleverness, to attach more and more importance to industry and physical endurance. Goethe said that industry is nine-tenths of genius, and Franklin that diligence is the mother of good luck. A thousand other tongues and pens have lauded work. Idleness and shiftlessness may set down as causing a large part of the failures of the world. On every side we see persons who started out with good educations and great promise, but who have gradually gone to seed. Their early ambition oozed out, their early ideals gradually dropped to lower standards. Ambition is a spring that sets the apparatus going. All the parts may be perfect, but the lack of a spring is a fatal defect. Without wish to rise, desire to accomplish, and to attain, no life will succeed largely. Chief among the causes which bring positive failure or a disappointing portion of half-success to thousands of honest strugglers is vacillation, said Thomas B. Bryan. Many a businessman has made his fortune by promptly deciding at some nice juncture to expose himself to a considerable risk. Yet many failures are caused by ill-advised changes and causeless vacillation of purpose. The vacillating man, however strong in other respects, is always pushed aside in the race of life by the determined man, the decisive man, who knows what he wants to do and does it. Even brains must give way to decision. One could almost say that no one ever failed that was steadfastly devoted to one aim, if that aim were not in itself unworthy. I am a great believer in a college education, but a great many college graduates have made failures of their lives who might have succeeded had they not gone to college, because they depended upon theoretical, impractical knowledge to help them on, and were not willing to begin at the bottom after graduation. On every hand we see men who did well in college, but who do very poorly in life. They stood high in their classes, were conscientious, hard workers, but somehow when they get out into life, they do not seem able to catch on. They are not practical. It would be hard to tell why they never get ahead, but there seems to be something lacking in their makeup, some screw loose somewhere. These brilliant graduates, but indifferently successful men, are often enigmas to themselves. They don't understand why they don't get on. There is no doubt that ill health is often the cause of failure, but this is often due to a wrong mental attitude, wrong thinking. The pessimistic, discouraged mental attitude is very injurious to good health. Worry, fear, anxiety, jealousy, extreme selfishness poison the system so that it does not perform its functions perfectly and will cause much ill health. A complete reversal of the mental attitude would bring robust health to multitudes of those who suffer from poor health. If people would only think right and live right, ill health would be very rare. A wrong mental attitude is the cause of a large part of physical weakness, disease, and suffering. It has been said that the two chief factors of success are industry and health. But the history of human triumphs over difficulties shows that the sick 
the crippled, the deformed, have often outrun the strong and hailed to the goal of success, in spite of tremendous physical handicaps. Many such instances are cited in other chapters of this volume. Where men have built an abiding success, industry and perseverance have proven the foundation stone of their great achievements. Every man may lay this foundation and build on for himself. Whatever a man's natural advantages may be, great or small, industry and perseverance are his, if he chooses. By the exercise of these qualities he may rise, as others have done, to success. If, like Palissy, he labors and endures and waits, and what he cannot find creates. When is success a failure? When you are doing the lower while the higher is possible. When you are not a cleaner, finer, larger man on account of your life work. When you live only to eat, drink, and have a good time, and accumulate money. When you do not carry a higher wealth in your character than in your pocketbook. When your higher brain cells have been crowded out of business by greed. When it has made conscience an accuser, and shut the sunlight out of your life. When all sympathy has been crushed out by selfish devotion to your vocation. When the attainment of your ambition has blighted the aspirations and crushed the hopes of others. When you plead that you never had time to cultivate your friendships, politeness, or good manners. When you have lost on your way your self-respect, your courage, your self-control, or any other quality of manhood, when you do not overtop your vocation, when you are not greater as a man than as a lawyer, a merchant, a physician, or a scientist, when you have lived a double life and practiced double dealing, when it has made you a physical wreck, a victim of nerves and moods, when the hunger for more money, more land, more houses and bonds has grown to be your dominant passion, when it has dwarfed you mentally and morally, and robbed you of the spontaneity and enthusiasm of youth, when it has hardened you to the needs and sufferings of others, and made you a scorner of the poor and unfortunate, when there is a dishonest or a deceitful dollar in your possession, when your fortune spells the ruin of widows and orphans, or the crushing of the opportunities of others, when your absorption in your work has made you practically a stranger to your family, when you go on the principle of getting all you can and giving as little as possible in return, when your greed for money has darkened and cramped your wife's life and deprived her of self-expression, of needed rest and recreation, or amusement of any kind. When the nervous irritability engendered by constant work without relaxation has made you a brute in your home and a nuisance to those who work for you. When you rob those who work for you of what is justly their due, and then pose as a philanthropist by contributing a small fraction of your unjust gains to some charity or to the endowment of some public institution. End of chapter 65 Why Some Succeed and Others Fail Recording by Luke Sartor, Brisbane, Queensland